that are joining us here today. If you're a guest with us, it really is an honor to have you here, and uh, we welcome you. So glad that you're here. Uh, my name's Brandon. I'd love the chance to meet you if I haven't already, and just, um, just to say thanks for coming. It's an honor to have you here with us. If you have your Bible, open with me to uh, John chapter 6 is where we're going to be, and then our theme verse is going to be Hebrews chapter 12. We're taking a break from our Roman series until right after Easter. We're going to dig back into the book of Romans, but we're starting a new series today called All Eyes on Jesus, and we're going to look at the miracles of Jesus through the gospel accounts, and we're going to just put our attention and focus on the Lord uh, as we lead up to Easter, only four weeks away from Easter. Um, our theme verse, if you're, taking, if, you're, if you're looking at it with me, Hebrews chapter 12, you can follow along with the message notes as well. Um, and uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says this, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let's read verse 2 together. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. So the way that we're able to run the race that God has for us, we put our eyes on Jesus. We put our attention and focus on him. And during this series, I want to encourage you not to just do this uh, at church on Sunday. We're going to be focusing on the life of Jesus here at church on Sunday. But every day, let's let that be our goal to, to put our eyes on Jesus this week. And so one of the ways to do that each day is we're going to read through the book of Matthew together as a church family every day. There's 28 days to Easter and 28 chapters in the book of Matthew. So uh, tomorrow we'll start Matthew chapter 1, and let's every day this week dig into the Word, just one chapter a day. And let's look at Jesus, let's put our focus on Jesus. And then also, I want to encourage everybody, if you haven't already, watch The Chosen. The Chosen's a TV uh, series, it's a dramatized TV series that shows the life of Jesus. And if you haven't checked it out, I promise it's, it's life-changing, you'll love it. And uh, if you've watched it already, watch it again. Let's, let, let's replace uh, some of the things that we distract ourselves with from an entertainment perspective. What, what would it look like? If for the next month we really just said, okay, I want to put my eyes on Jesus. How would your life change if you said, okay, my goal every day, I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. Every day I'm going to put my focus on him. I'm going to read about Jesus. I'm going to watch things that depict the life of Jesus. And I'm going to put my eyes on Jesus so that I can run with perseverance the race that God has marked out for me. And so I'm so excited about this series. We did this last year where we took clips from the chosen that coincide with the scripture and uh, walk through that. And, and the thing I love about it is it, it shows Jesus' personality and it shows uh, some of the miracles from a fresh perspective. And so today I want to show you the miracle. There's only two miracles that are listed in all four gospel. One is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the other miracle that is mentioned in all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is um, this one you're about to see right now. So turn your attention to the screen. Check this out. What you know of the hidden treasure, that makes it worth everything. Have you come closer to here, Betty? No, there, there is an issue. My friends, if you'll excuse me, I must speak with my students a moment. Rabbi, mm. people are a lot of food. <laughs> Some have been without food for days, others have traveled a great distance. So, give them something to eat. We're out of food. They're out of food. Is it time to send them home? Well, at this point, they're so hungry and tired, if we send them home, they'll faint along the way. You knew they were hungry? Yes, Judas. I can see them while I'm talking. Ah. <laughs> mm. Well, this is a tough one. Where can we buy some bread for all these people? Well, we only came with a little over 200 denarii. <laughs> Rabbi, that's not even enough to get a little bit for everyone. I wouldn't even know how to calculate that. Matthew and I can calculate that. That's really easy. Maybe if we go into the cities, we can negotiate something on credit. Yes. Yes, that could work. Negotiate with whom? The closest city is Abila, and its entire population is here. It's nine miles away, and even if we raided every house in town, we'd have to find a way to bring it back here, and it would still only feed a fraction of the masses. Can you bring me anything? Surely there's some food from someone, even a small amount. Five loaves of bread, 
and two fish. But what is this for some help? Barley loaves. Two fish and five barley loaves. Thank you for clarifying. This is humiliating. John? He will take care of it if he wants to. You look scared. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid that he'll choose them. This is wonderful bread, Telemachus. I know it's not enough. Oh, it's enough for me. I can do a lot with this. Thank you. King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the dead. I said to find some bread. If they've got bread, be ready. We'll probably be first. Feed them. What has changed? Are we organize the people into groups of 50 and 100. Gather up 12 baskets to distribute the loaves and fish. Was I unclear? Ah, uh, no. This feels familiar. Maybe. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the gardens. It becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can come and make their nests in its branches. Dang it, I got one. Let's just come on, break up the bread. There, you take some. There. Where's the track? Do you need some? Give me some of that. Just like that. Just like yeah. that. Yeah. There. There. You too. Anyone need some? It's better than the tail. That's the last of it. Yeah, that's the last of it. <sighs> All right. Marcus, you can have your basket back. I've kept you here all this time, giving you spiritual food. But you clearly need actual food now. So let's eat!
that awesome? <laughs> no. Really makes you think, what would it have been like to be there? And I, I want during this series to take these people that saw Jesus face to face and to see what it would be like to see these miracles from their perspective because this was so dynamic. Every one of the um, gospel writers would include it because it was that important because really it would, it, it would instruct them in the future in the ministry that God had called them to that God was about to do something new through them. So I want to share just four, uh, four things from this feeding of the 5,000 story that we see in the Gospels um, that the disciples, I believe if they were here today, they, this is what they would encourage us with. And here's, here's the first one. I think that the disciples would say to us simply this, your setback, if you're taking notes, is a setup for a miracle. Your setback is a setup for a miracle. They undoubtedly thought Jesus had made a mistake. They thought this setback of not having enough food took God by surprise. And, and, and it's the same in our lives. We think the setbacks that we're facing, it, it, that, that it's taken God by surprise and that it really can stop or hinder the plan that God has for our life. And, and Jesus, I believe, allowed this question to be po posed to the disciples so that they would never forget that God can use setbacks and he can use difficult circumstances. He can use everything that looks impossible and he can actually turn it into the greatest miracle of our lives. That whatever it is that you're struggling with, he can take it and he can turn it into a miracle. That he can take your impossibility and he can bring healing out of it and he can bring restoration out of it and he can bring deliverance out of it. He can touch your wayward family. He can change your body. He can do what only he can do in your career and in your marriage and every area of life where we face setbacks, God says, it's really not a setback if you're walking with Jesus. If you're not walking with Jesus, the, the, the challenge Jesus you face, there's not much hope for it. But if you're walking with Jesus, if you're a disciple of Jesus, then you can trust that there's no impossibility you're going to walk through, that God's not already in complete control of every circumstance. Jesus asked a question. I love it. We kind of see it a little bit in the video. But John chapter 6, where we're going to be uh, a lot today, John chapter 6 in verse 5, it says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look at him and turning to Philip. <laughs> this is so good. He asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? <laughs> I, I just feel like when Jesus was asking this question, he was like, had a little bit of a smirk on his face, a little bit of a, little bit of a smile. Because here's the truth. If Jesus asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> Look at it. Verse 6, he was testing Philip. For what? He already knew what he was going to do. If Jesus allows a question to be poised to be posed to your life, if he allows a question to be asked of your circumstance, God, how is this going to happen? How am I going to be able to provide? How are you going to work this out? God, I didn't see this coming. It's, he allows that question, not because he doesn't know the answer, because he wants you to know if you realize he is the answer for every impossibility we face. <laughs> Jesus had been doing miracles up to this point, and they had been watching him do miracles. But now it had transitioned. Jesus had given them authority to heal the sick. He had sent them out. He was wanting them to know he wasn't just the miracle worker, but he was going to give them authority to work miracles in their world. And I want to say that God does not just want you to recognize that he can do a miracle. He wants you to recognize that he wants to do miracles through you. He wants to do miracles through your life. That when you come here and you listen or you watch online or you're, you're here in the room, know this, that you're not here by accident, but that God has put divine power in you through the Holy Spirit so that you would change your world around you, so that you would make a difference in your school, so that you would make a difference in your workplace and in your neighborhood. That God was trying to give them this reality that he wants to use them to make a difference. But says verse 7, Philip replied this, even if we worked for months, 
who wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Philip, all he saw was a problem. God was trying to see if he would see the possibility. But the problem was it was a different miracle. They had seen God do healings, but they'd never seen him multiply fish and bread. And that's our challenge too. We see God do miracles, but then we think because it's a different miracle, he's not going to be faithful now like he was in the others. We, we, we think, well, God provided for me financially, but he can't heal my body. God saved me and he changed my life, but he can't touch my family. He can't work out my, my life. He can't, he can't do this thing that seems impossible in my life. And what he's trying to communicate to the disciples is the same thing he's saying to us. I'm the same God yesterday as I am today, and I'll be the same God tomorrow for every circumstance you face. But in the middle of the impossibility, in the middle of the challenge, we got to trust God. A lot of the challenges we face are the result of prayers that we prayed. And I've seen that with this church. I remember when we were purchasing this facility three years ago, uh, we were meeting in a, a small uh, former DMV warehouse about 10 minutes west of here, and I remember how big this facility was. We, were at, we had about 7,000 feet at our other facility, and this was 67,000 feet. And I remember I, I, whenever I would be full of worries or fear, I'd drive here at night, and I would just sit on the steps, and I would look around, and I just would hear this voice, nobody's going to come here. Nobody's going to show up to this place. And at the time, it was just really one major parking lot there right down the steps and then a, a, a small one to the side. There were none of the gravel parking lots or anything like that. And I would just sit there and hear these voices. And then I would just hear this calming voice of the Holy Spirit saying, it's all going to be all right. And in my mind's eye, I remember seeing those parking lots that we have now. And I just felt like the Lord said, I'm going to use every inch of this facility for my glory. And I've seen him do it over the last three years. I've seen God miraculously send people. But back in November, my wife and I were t- taking a Sunday off when we were actually in Arizona doing some hiking, uh, and it was Sunday morning, and we were just getting away, enjoying time, just her and I together, and uh, on that Sunday morning that I wasn't here, I got this, fo- this photo texted to me uh, of the interstate backed up as people were getting off of it to come to church, and they sent this to me as, a, as trying to be encouraging to me. Hey, you're gone. Look at miracles of what God's doing. He's sending people. And I remember I was so stressed out when I got this photo. (laughs) I was enjoying, you know, Arizona, you know, trying to keep my mind off of things I'd been stressed out about. And here I am completely stressed. And I just started talking to my wife. Said, what are we going to do? We're out of parking. What are we going to do? We need more room. We need more space. How, how are we going to, how are we going to find out? And, And my blood pressure started going up and up and up and up and up. And she stopped on the trail where we were hiking and turned around and looked at me and she said, honey, I got a question. I said, okay. She said, who is sending the people? I said, okay, simple answer. Jesus is sending the people. She said, who's going to provide the people a space that are coming? I said, okay, Uh, Jesus is going to (laughs) provide. And what she was saying in that moment is just because this is a new miracle. This just understand the same God who's brought us to this place is the same God that's going to take care of us. In other words, just because it's a different problem doesn't mean we have have to find a new solution. It's the same solution to every problem. The same God that sent the people is going to be the God that provides space for the people. The same God who brought you to this place in your life is the same God that's going to take you to the next place that you can trust every step of the way. Don't get in your own power. Don't try to figure it out in your own strength. But every step of the way, say, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to walk after you every step of the way. The answer is Jesus. Can you say that with me? The answer is Jesus. One more time. That's so good. The answer is Jesus. What's your problem? The answer is Jesus. Peace is a person, Jesus. It's not acquiring things that we think we need. It's not solving the problem. The answer is that Jesus is with us and he will never fail. Your problems, your setbacks, they're setups for God to do miracles in your life. Here's the second thing that I believe that they would say uh, to us is simply this. Don't count people out. Don't count people out. 
verse 8 of John 6. So, so Philip saw the problem. Andrew saw some possibility. I love it. Simon Peter's brother spoke up. He said, there's a young boy here with five loaves and two fish. <laughs> but then he has his own doubt. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Here's what I love about this story. Jesus used somebody that everybody else didn't count to do the miracle. So we call it the feeding of the 5,000. It wasn't really the feeding of the 5,000. It was a feeding of probably at least 20,000 because only the men were counted. God uses somebody, a child, who wasn't included in the count to count, to do the miracle for God. I'm preaching to somebody today, you feel discounted, you feel marginalized, you feel like your past, maybe other people look at you and think God can never use you because of what you're not. What, what, you think if I was somebody else, then God would use me. It's not true. God counts in others, that the people that other people count out. God sees value in you. He sees potential in you. He sees a calling in you. I love it. It didn't matter that he was young or old. It didn't matter if he was rich or poor. We don't know his name. We don't know his background, but we simply know this, that God can use anybody who is just willing to be used. Anybody who's willing to give what they have, God can use it. So I say, church family, let's never discount anybody that we see. I believe the disciples would say that. They say that through this miracle, God changed our perspective, that he can use a child. He can use, he can use the smallest among us to do a miracle. He can, use, he can use anybody, anywhere. God can use you to do a miracle in your workplace. You say, oh, it's bad. There's circumstances all around me. Nobody's serving God. Do you know God could use you? Don't discount yourself. And don't discount those people you work with that it may look like from the external that they have no hope of ever serving Jesus. You don't know what God can do through their life. You don't know the miracle that God could do through somebody that other people have discounted. As a matter of fact, I think the reason why so many people run from God is because of Christians that have discounted them. Because of churches that have discounted them because of their failures or because of their past or because of the color of their skin or because of what they've been through. But I'm so thankful that when God looks at us, he doesn't look at us like other people look at us. When God looks at us, he doesn't see us just with our problems. He sees the potential inside of us. He knows what's in the basket. He knows what the potential is in there. The other people may say, oh, it's a small, just a couple fish, just some loaves. They don't have nothing to be, to be able to offer in their basket. But I love in the video, Jesus said, oh, I can do a lot with this. <laughs> what if we saw our neighbors and saw people that other people uh, overlook and said, oh, God could do something great with this. Oh, God could do something great with your life. Oh, God could do something awesome through you. You just keep on trusting him. You just keep on believing. Don't discount people. I love it. They, they saw the value. I, I love it, even the value of a child. A child that probably didn't pack their own lunch, if they're anything like my kids. Somebody packed that lunch. I was thinking that's even an illustration of what's happening at City Hills Kids right now and what happens every Wednesday night, City Hills students, middle schoolers and high schoolers. What's happening? Leaders are serving to pack those backpacks full of fish and loaves. Parents, when you're, when, when you're leading your kids around that family prayer time at the table that you feel like is just straight up from the circus, I mean, kids are running and jumping and you're thinking, man, I don't want to pray right now. I don't want to, you know, I, I feel that sometimes. You're putting the kids to bed and I'm like, Lord, my prayer is let me not kill these kids and let them go to bed quickly in Jesus' name. You know, like you, you're just... You're just wondering, is anything getting through? Is anything happening? And the truth is, oh, no, no, no. Parents, don't be discouraged. Grandparents, don't be discouraged. People serving, don't be discouraged. You're loading up that backpack full of blessings, and God's going to take it and multiply it and use it for his glory. Don't be discouraged. Don't be sad. Keep on trusting that God can do it. I, I, I'm who I am because of people that saw value and a kid others could easily discount. I think about a lady that was my Sunday school teacher whenever I was growing up. Um, her name was, we called her Sister Brenda. I grew up in church where you, you said brother and sister a lot. Like it, 
works out great when you forget people's names because you're just like, praise the Lord, brother. You know, that's, you don't have to remember anybody's name. <laughs> Somebody needs to bring that back. Praise the Lord, brother, you know. But uh, her name was Sister Brenda, and she was my Sunday school teacher whenever I, um, whenever um, I was walking through, my parents walking through um, divorce, um, whenever I was five years old. And of all the teachers I had, she always stuck out to me, and she, um, she was always so uh, happy to see me every Sunday morning. And uh, she, would, she, she made like an award and gave it to me that I still have at my, at my mom's house. All these things, like it made a huge impact. And, and now looking back, I understand why. It's because I was going through a, a difficult time. But she, in the middle of that difficult time, thought I counted. And she cared for me. And I didn't realize until later in life that, um, so we would sit at these like tables in the church I grew up in as kids and the tables and the Sunday school tables and she would always sit in the chair and I didn't realize it until after a while she would never stand up and it was because she had a disability and she was in a wheelchair. And she was, uh, she was always an encourager to me and she was, she was still at that church whenever I started uh, preaching and all those all those things years later, but she was always an encouragement to me. And what I what I what I found so interesting and just so encouraging is the fact that even though she was going through her own challenges, she still had this spirit that every child counted to God and loved and cared for in in her own way. Uh, people that maybe were going through a hard time. And I, I just say all that to say this. You don't know the impact that you can have on somebody's life if you're just willing to be there and to let them know they count. When you show up to a small group, here's, here's a great goal. Instead of focusing on your needs, just say, God, help me to show people the love of God. Help me to show people that they matter. When I show up at work, God, help me to show people that they count in God's eyes. Help me to show people that, God, you love them and you care for them and that they belong here. Let City Hills Church be a church for, for all people. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you came from. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter anything because when you come in this place, you come to a God who loves you and you matter to him and he can use your life to multiply his miracles if you'll just trust him. I think he would say, they would say simply, don't, 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 don't count people out. Don't, don't see people as problems alone. In Matthew's gospel of this account, uh, the disciples went to Jesus at first and said, hey, send away the crowd. And, and the word for crowd there is the word rabble. It's like, send this, this bunch of people that get on our nerves, send them away. These, send these needy people away. It's like I, I, it gets on my nerves when people say, people that are in the ministry say, oh, you know, it'd be, you know ministry would be great if it, not, if it were not for people. And I'm thinking... <laughs> I hate that statement because thank God that somebody didn't see you as just nothing but a problem. Thank God that, that people are not just rabble to Jesus. When everybody else just wanted to send the people away, Jesus, the Bible said, had compassion on them, and he saw them like sheep that were without a shepherd. He saw people. God, give us your eyes for people. God, give us your eyes for people that are broken. Give us your eyes for people that are lost and people that are far from God. Give us the eyes of Jesus that we would see people as more than problems. We would see people as possibilities. In your seat there are some Easter invitations. And I want to encourage you to take those with you and put them in your pocket and pray, God, show me people that I can invite to come to Easter. Let me not count anybody out, but let me count everybody in and invite them to be an includer of people. Invite them to Easter. Okay, here's the third thing. Jesus can turn not enough into more than enough when you put it in his hands. You see, you can, you, you can be near Jesus but not experience the miracles of Jesus working through you if you keep everything in your hands instead of putting your life in his hands. And a lot of the times the reason why we struggle to give God what we have is because it's not enough. We think, well, I would give God if I had more to give. God, I would, I would serve if I, had, if I had time to do it. God, I just have a little window. I can't really do that much. I can't really make that much of a difference. 
But I think it's interesting. This boy's lunch that the Bible even says itself, it was small, it was little, was put in the hands of Jesus, and little became much in the hands of Jesus. See, it depends whose hands it's in. <laughs> everything depends on, on, on whose hands it's in. Are, are you going to keep everything in your hands, or are you going to put it in the hands of Jesus? You say, well, I don't have much to give Jesus. Well, you just give him what you have, and as you give Jesus what you have, he'll take it and multiply it to do miracles. But the problem is we want to hold on to what we have because the, the, the many times we're holding on to our past. We're holding on to our failures. And I was thinking about what the things that we hold on to along the way, and I just want to, I want to ask a question. What's in your basket? Because the miracle didn't start until the young man's basket was empty. The miracle didn't start until everything was given to Jesus. And that is to say Christianity only works one way, all in. It's not halfway in and halfway out. That's one of the hardest things in the world to do. Try to live for God with one foot in and one foot out. Maybe you're discouraged and everything's not working because you know what? You're, you're, you're living with one foot in, one foot out. What is that? It's, it's as if you're just giving Jesus one of the fish and a loaf. Well, well, Jesus, if I gave you that, what would I have for me? The boy didn't say that. The boy said, okay, here's my incomplete. And there's no way in a crowd of 20,000 people, this boy was the only one that had anything to give. But the, he was the only one that had the faith and courage to give. So, so my question is, do you still have anything in your basket this Sunday morning? When you come in here, are you giving God partial of your life? Are you, you giving it all, even the parts that are not enough? See, some of the things we keep in our basket, some of us, we keep our failures in our basket. We're full of shame because of our past. We say, I don't want anybody to know my failures. And if I really serve God, if I really dug in and served God, if I really got in that small group, if I really went to next steps and, and chose to serve to make a difference, then you know what? What if I failed again? So, so I'm going to keep that in my basket. Here's another thing we keep in our basket, control. God, I, I'm going to stay in control of my life because I've been hurt in the past. And so some of us are living as control freaks. We're trying to control people. We're trying to control our, our, our work. We're trying to control everything with us because at the truth, if we were honest, we'd say, God, I don't trust people and I, and I don't trust you. So I'm going to keep that in my basket. Some of us, we're keeping problems from the past with people. We're keeping unforgiveness in our basket. We've been hurt by people. There's been people that have said things and done things to us that were not fair. Some of us have been abused. Some of us have had words said over us that, that, that roll over in our mind day after day, and we can be triggered by the past, triggered by what people have said over us, triggered by the abuse, triggered by what we walked through in childhood. And so what we do, we say, God, instead of giving that to you, I'm going to keep this in my basket because at least I'm right, and, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to let them off the hook instead of realizing that when we hold on to unforgiveness, it's like setting ourselves on fire and expecting the other person to die. Some of us, we're, we're holding on to our plans. We got plans for our life, and the Holy Spirit comes. Some of us, God's leading you on a journey, and you had plans for how it was going to go, and God's plans are different than your plans and you have a choice. Are you going to hold on to your plans? Or are you going to give your plans to God? But the, the, the boy, I just love his spirit. The boy said, you know what? I'm going to give everything into the hands of Jesus. I'm going to put it, pour out the basket. I'm going to have an empty basket. My plans, my unforgiveness, my failures, my doubts, my fears. I'm going to give them all to Jesus. And the, one, the moment the basket was empty, the miracle began in this situation. The moment the basket is empty. The moment your life is, in, the moment you're saying, God, I am all in, that's the moment everything changes. It's easy to, to, to be halfway in. I was thinking about this whenever I went to church as a teenager. That, that really described my life well. I was a half in, half out kind of teenager. I lived for God, you know, in, in, you know, in name or 
um, in, 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 as a show, as a facade in a lot of ways. And I, I live one way at school and when, then one way um, at church. And we went to a church camp whenever I was uh, in high school before I really surrendered my life to Jesus. And uh, it was in the days where we, would, we had CDs and these big trapper keepers of CDs. Anybody remember something like that? I had this big trapper keeper of CDs and, and uh, we would burn CDs too. And we'd make these mixtapes and, and all the things. And we, we would, uh, at this youth camp, someone was preaching about how we should throw away all the you know, worldly CDs that we had, you know, and throw them in the fire. And so at the end of this service, they had a big bonfire at the end, and, and, uh, and, and we all went back to our rooms, and we got all the music that we shouldn't have had, you know, that we were, and we keep them back, and we, we went and threw it in the fire. And, and so I went, and I got, some, I got some of mine, and I threw them in the fire, and I had a friend said, man, how did you do that? It didn't even look hard to you. And I, and I, I, I said to him, don't tell anybody, but I already have burned copies of all those that I, <laughs> I got copies of all the stuff I threw away. Because <laughs> it looked like I was all in. You follow me? It looked like I was all in. But the truth is, no, I was holding some things back. I'm going to say, don't hold anything back from God. Maybe you've been hurt by people. Maybe you've been hurt by church. I am so sorry if that's the case. But God, he loves you. He has a plan for your life. And the miracle doesn't start until the basket is empty. And maybe that's for somebody today. You just need to stand before God with empty hands saying, God, I give it all to you. And whatever you want to do with it, however you want to handle this, it's not in my hands anymore. It's in your hands. Because as, the, as that young man had open hands, as God used that child, the, the Bible says that these, these disciples begin to pass out the miracles in the lives of other people. And that's the fourth thing I want to share with you today is, simple, is simply this, is that if you will live with open hands, when you live with open hands, God will always provide your needs. When you live with open hands, God will provide for your needs. Here's what the scripture says in verse 12 of John 6. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. I think sometimes we, we think like this, that if, if I were to really go all in for God, I'm not going to have enough. And maybe this is you. If you're somebody who you're, you are already all in, and you're living your life um, to serve others and to do ministry. You, you're like the disciples. You've decided to follow Jesus. There will be times where you wonder, if I give all this away, because they were hungry, mind you. There's this feeling, God, if I give this away, is there going to be anything left over for me? And maybe you're here and the enemy's been lying to you to say, God's not going to provide He's not, he doesn't know where you are. He's not real. He's using you. You're not going to be at a good place. But I find it interesting there in that passage where not, God not only provided for the people, but God also made sure that the disciples had everything that they need. And that's a word for somebody today. If you'll live with open hands, you can trust that God will always provide not only through you for the needs of others, but God will always make sure you have what you need. Because you're called to the ministry. I think that's the point of what Jesus was trying to tell them. They were called to the ministry. I think sometimes we think, no, that's like for preachers and people that work at churches. But the truth is, Jesus was trying to tell them, you, if you'll Trust me, I'll use your life to multiply other people. I'll use your life to make a difference if you'll just trust me and follow me. And it, it's not giving God just the big, huge things. It's just trusting the voice of the Holy Spirit to do the little things. I'll conclude with this story. One of my favorite stories is something I heard years ago from a missionary that would come to the church I grew up in every year. Her name was Nona Freeman. And she spent a lifetime of ministry in Africa with her husband. 
And she told a story about something that happened before she went on the mission field. At that time, it was over 40 years ago. At this time, it's probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 years ago. She was washing dishes at the end of a dirt, at the, she lived on a dirt road out in the country in Texas. And while she was washing dishes, she felt the Lord say to her so strong, go out on your front porch and wave. And she thought, that is the weirdest thing. What do you mean, go wave? There's nobody out there. But she just, the Lord kept speaking to her. So she went out on the front porch of the steps and just started waving her hand. And she said, this feels stupid. I don't know what I'm doing. A couple moments later, she sees a dust cloud in a car coming down this dirt road. So she kept feeling that from the Lord, wave. So, so she just smiled and she waved all at that car the whole way down the road and just followed it all the way down the road. Burden lifted and she went back in the house and forgot about it. Until over 30 years later, she was back in America and she was telling the story about following God in the little things and how God wants to use you, even if you're at home washing dishes and you follow what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. And she had a man walk up to her after the end of that message. He said, you're not going to believe this, but 30 years ago, I'd made up in my mind I was going to kill myself because everything looked impossible. And I went to drive out on a dirt road. He said, whenever I felt like I was hopeless, I said, Lord, if you're real, give me a sign and I won't die today. And she said, he said, I saw a lady on the front porch of her house waving and it felt like the, an angel of God waving at me. And he said, I gave my life to Jesus and I've been serving God ever since. I've never forgot that story. Because you know what? Only eternity will tell the impact of just small acts of giving your life to Jesus. She just got the benefit of seeing one in her lifetime. But what Stories will we hear in heaven from a life that's willing to live open-handed before God. I don't know about you, but that's the life I want to live. I want to live an open-handed life where God multiplies and feeds the broken. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me pray for us here today. Thank you for letting me share from God's word today. Jesus, we turn our eyes on you. We turn our eyes toward you. Lord, you're better than our wildest dreams. You're better than our wildest imaginations. I pray for anybody who's experiencing a setback right now in their life. Holy Spirit, would you come and let them know it's going to be all right if they just keep trusting you. You're not allowing a question that you're not already the answer to. So increase our faith, God. Lord, help us to notice people around us. Let us not be a church that discounts anybody. But Lord, let us be people that see possibilities in others, God. And let us give you what we have. Give you our time. Give you our money. Give you our resources. Give you everything, our hopes and dreams, our failures, our successes. God, let us just put it all in your hands. Lord, we know it's not enough. But God, you can make it more than enough. Lord, and use our lives to be multipliers. God, use our lives to be open-handed. Let us not be stingy. Let us not be fearful. Let us not be afraid. Let us live with open hands and trust the faithful God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Nobody looking around. If you're here today, here in the South Auditorium, the North Auditorium, or you're watching online, I would love to pray for you today. If you've been far from God, I'd love to lead you in a prayer to surrender your life to Jesus today, maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time. You can't multiply in your own power. You can't fix the need in your own power. You need Jesus. Jesus is the answer today. So let's turn to him. I invite you to pray this simple prayer with me, a prayer for a fresh start with God. Let's pray this together. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my failures. I give you my past. I give you my hopes and dreams. My whole life is yours. Save me. Change me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I bow my knee and surrender to you. I choose today to trust you with my life. 
I choose today to follow you. Wherever you lead, my life is in your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this place in Jesus' name. Can we give God a hand clap of praise today?